Well, today I wanted to do another reaction video to a Sabina Hosenfelder video, Where Did the Big Bang Happen? And as I said previously, I do admire that she's willing to point out flaws in the standard model, um, but she misses a whole lot of flaws and overlooks them, and this is one of them. Um, the Big Bang didn't happen, so this is not even a real question. And you can start by saying, well, causality. Causality is a real thing. So there's no in the beginning, because there's no beginning. Because in order to have effect, you have to have a cause. In order to have a cause, something has to be physically present. So causality and determinism requires a universe that's infinitely old. And with that, I'll go ahead and let her start her video. And you can see my comments in yellow. The universe started with the Big Bang and it's expanded ever since. You probably know this. You probably also know that the universe doesn't have a center. But where did the Big Bang happen if not in the center of the universe? And if the universe expands, doesn't that mean that matter on the average doesn't move? Contrary to what Einstein said, that absolute rest doesn't exist. I get these questions a lot. And at the end of this video, you will know the answers. Well, you see from the start, there's already a bunch of problems. There was no Big Bang, so no expansion. There's no center. And there is a rest frame. So those are problems that she starts off with. But in order to understand where I'm coming from, I'm more of a quantum field theorist while she's taking the point of being a relativist, a general relativist. And so I started out with basic quantum field theory knowledge. One is the quantum field has always existed. There is no form of physics where there is no quantum field. There is no way to get rid of it in real physics. The quantum field is boundless. There is no way of putting a boundary on the quantum field in quantum field theory. Dimensions, clock rates, permittivity, permeability, the speed of light, all other physical constants all emerge from the quantum field. They form a unique set. So all those constants tell us that the laws of physics, the natural laws of physics, have always been the same because they come from the quantum field and the quantum field's always there. Now, as I mentioned before, the quantum field has a rest frame. And that's something that doesn't fit with special relativity. So universe and space are not physical. If you look at their definition, they're containers. The universe contains all space and matter. Space contains all matter. And they're both boundless regions. So they're both, by definition, just abstract containers. And there's no restrictions on time or dimensions. And there's no description of something physical being there. The most elementary physical thing is the quantum field, and that's where the physicality, where the dimensions come from. So the universe and space have no dimensions. And then we have the question of matter. If matter can be produced without any matter, it can be produced at any time. Because the laws of physics haven't changed. The natural laws of physics are the same now as they were 15 billion years ago, 1,000 billion years ago, or even 15 billion years into the future. So if protons and electrons were somehow produced by the universe naturally, then it happens now. It's happening now. And we can do it. So those are the points I want to make. And because all those things that are built into quantum field theory tear holes into Big Bang theory. 
So here's the second part of her video. Let's talk about the universe. First of all, what's the Big Bang? The Big Bang... The Big Bang is what you get if you take Einstein's equations and extrapolate the present state of the universe back in time. The universe presently expands, so if you go back in time, it contracts and the matter in it becomes more and more compressed. The equations say that when you've gone back about 13.7 billion years, you run into a singularity at which the density of matter must have been infinitely large. This moment is what we call the Big Bang. There are two warnings I have to add when it comes to the Big Bang. First, I don't know anybody who actually believes that this singularity is physically real. It probably just means that Einstein's equations break down and must be replaced by something else. For this reason, physicists use the term Big Bang to refer to whatever it is that replaces the singularity to within a Planck time or so. A Planck time is about 10 to the minus 44 seconds. Second, we don't actually know that this extrapolation all the way back to the Big Bang is correct because we have no observations dating back to before roughly the creation of atomic nuclei. It could be that Einstein's equations actually aren't the right ones for the very early universe. So instead of a Big Bang, it could also be that an earlier universe collapsed and then expanded again, which is called a Big Bounce. Or there could have been an infinitely long time in which not much happened, after which expansion suddenly began. That would also look much like a Big Bang. We just don't know which one's right. The Big Bang is just the simplest scenario you get when you naively extrapolate the equations back in time. But if the Big Bang did happen, where did it happen? It seems that if the universe expands, it must have come out of some place, right? Well, no. Like so many popular science confusions, this one is created by the attempt to visualize what can't be visualized. Well, you can see from the second section that she's introduced even more problems. Even if there were a Big Bang, you don't need Einstein's equations to describe it. Uh, there's no singularity. There's no infinite density. Quantum gravity is how you really need to describe it to begin with. Uh, there's no Planck time because there's no gravity at the Planck scale. Quantum fluctuations don't gravitate and they're the only thing that exists at the Planck scale. The smallest particles that we know for sure are the protons. Those are the smallest ones we can measure at 10 to the minus 15 meters, which is 20 orders of magnitude bigger than the Planck scale. So, the Planck time and the Planck's length contain G, but we have no scientific evidence that G is the same at the Planck scale as it is at our scale. Um, so that's just wrong. It's a wrong assumption. It's not based on real physics. And so that's why I poke holes at that. There can't be a big bank bounce one problem they, they ignore because the laws of physics are the same. Once matter would be compressed down to a small size, it would form a black hole and it wouldn't expand again. So <laughs> that's a problem with big bang balance models. And then we have the issue with the belief in a big bang is a belief in the redshift being expansion. But that's an assumption based on perpetual motion, that light has perpetual energy and never loses energy. And the thing about the real universe is everything loses energy because everything is interacting with everything else. Every photon is interacting with every massive body in the entire universe. And that costs energy. So the assumption that an expanding universe has to come from a redshifting red shifting photons is, is a false assumption. So with that, we'll go on to the third video.
begin with, as I explained in an earlier video, the universe doesn't expand into anything. So the image of an inflating balloon is very misleading. When we say that the universe expands, we're talking about what happens inside the universe. Therefore, that the universe expands is not a statement about the size of the universe as a whole. That wouldn't make sense because in Einstein's theory, the universe is infinitely large. It is infinitely large now and has always been infinitely large. That the universe expands means that the distances between locations in the universe increase. And that can happen even though the size is infinite. Suppose you have an elastic strap with buttons on it. And imagine the strap is space and the buttons are galaxy clusters. If you stretch the strap, the distances between the buttons increase. That's what it means for the universe to expand. It's the intergalactic space that expands. Now just imagine the strap is three-dimensional and infinitely large. Okay, easier said than done, I know. But this is how the mathematics works. If you go back in time to the Big Bang, all distances, areas and volumes go to zero. But this happens at every point in space and the size of the universe is still infinite. How can the size of the universe possibly be infinite if all distances go to zero? But wait, didn't you hear someone say that the universe was the size of a grapefruit at the Big Bang? They were referring only to the part of the universe that we can see today. The part that we can see has a finite size because light had only those 13.7 billion years to travel. So anything farther away from us than that, we can't see. We are in the middle of the part that we can see just because light travels the same in all directions. The mass in the visible part of the universe is finite. And yes, if there really was a Big Bang, then all that mass was once compressed into a volume similar to that of a grapefruit or really whatever fruit you want. But the Big Bang still happened everywhere in that grapefruit. And with this one, you can see she doubles down on the idea that the universe and space have dimensions and that they can expand when there's no expansion, there's no contraction, there's no curvature. So none of that's real. That's just a fiction. It's imaginary. Einstein had a Gedanken experiment where he imagined what if the universe was physical and had dimensions? And all the physicists ran with it. Well, it's strictly imaginary physics. It's fictitious physics. And I mentioned degeneracy pressure when she talks about all the mass in the universe being the size of a grapefruit. And that's because there's a pressure that forms between protons and between neutrons that prevents them from getting compressed beyond a certain point. And we don't have any known way of overcoming that. Relativists just assume that somehow they can compress it further, but there's no evidence that we can. Uh, as far as we know, that force that's pushing protons and neutrons apart is the strongest force that we, we know so far, because it's stronger than the strong force pushing them together. And with that, we'll do the last section. Okay. In general relativity, matter or all kinds of energy really affect the geometry of space and time. And so in the presence of matter, the universe indeed gets a preferred direction of expansion. And you can be in rest with the universe. This state of rest is usually called the co-moving frame. So that's the reference frame that moves with the universe. This doesn't disagree with Einstein at all. What is the co-moving frame of the universe? It's normally assumed to be the same as the rest frame of the cosmic microwave background, or at least very similar to it. So what you can do is you measure the radiation of the cosmic microwave background that is coming at us from all directions. If we were in rest with the cosmic microwave background, the energy in that radiation should be the same in all directions. This isn't the case though. Instead, we see that the radiation has somewhat more energy into one particular direction and less energy in the exact opposite direction. This can be attributed to our motion through the rest frame of the universe. How fast do we move? 
Well, we move in many ways because the Earth is spinning and orbiting around the Sun, which is orbiting around the center of the Milky Way. So really our direction constantly changes. But the Milky Way itself moves at about 630 kilometers per second relative to the cosmic microwave background. That's about a million miles per hour. Where are we going? We're moving towards something called the Great Attractor. And no one has any idea what that is or why we're going there. Well, in his last section, she mentions that under general relativity, matter changes the geometry of space and the universe. Well, as I've said, space and the universe don't have any dimensions by themselves because they're not physical. The dimensions come from the quantum field. And matter does not change the dimensions of the quantum field. But what it does do is it changes the permittivity and permeability, which changes the speed of light. And the changing speed of light and the changing dielectric constant is what causes the general relativistic effects. And the thing is, Einstein knew this back in 1907 because he did the, his calculations originally assuming that matter change the dielectric constant. And if you do that, you come up with an alternative form of general relativity that works just fine and unifies gravity with quantum field theory. And she also mentions the cosmic microwave background, which has a rest frame. So those are my comments on her video and a bunch of mistakes that she made, things that won't be considered real physics decades from now or a hundred years from now, whenever they pull their head out of their butt. So I hope you enjoy the video and if you do, please like it, share it with your friends, subscribe for my next ones and I do have books for sale if you'd like to support my research by reading my books and learning more about quantum field theory and particle theory. I talk a little bit about the Big Bang in my book The Hundred Greatest Lies in Physics because there are several of them and talk about in that book, but I don't really discuss it very much else otherwise. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed watching. Thanks.